Good to have you guys here. Well, if you're new to Authentic Church, you know, we're a Bible-based, spirit-empowered, presence-driven church. We love the presence of God. And when we gather together on a Sunday morning, and if you go back and you take a look at the formation of the New Testament church, their gatherings, when they would gather together, um, it, it was really a time for the believers in the community to come together to worship, to give thanks, to receive teaching, uh, to encourage each other, to share what they had in common. And it was just a, just a beautiful representation of what the kingdom of heaven looks like. And when we gather together, you know, the presence of the Lord is here. And for some of you in this time of worship, uh, maybe that was a little bit new to you. Uh, I grew up Catholic. Uh, so Catholic roots right here, Reformed Catholic. And uh, so I felt really comfortable walking into this building, but I would not have necessarily felt comfortable walking in and singing loud or, or clapping or shouting, even though when you read the Bible, that's what worship was. Worship was a loud, boisterous affair. It was clapping and shouting and dancing and music and song. I mean, it was amazing. And uh, you know, yesterday, uh, friends of ours, they, they're they massive uh, college football fans. And so our neighbors across, they had a big old party, and they watched the Georgia Bulldogs whoop up on the poor Oregon Ducks. It was, it was and, and when you go into their house, their house was filled with screams and shouts, and, you know, they're whooping it up and everything like that. And I'm like, man, that's, that's actually, according to the Bible, that's actually what our Sunday mornings should look like. And unfortunately, sometimes a stadium full of uh, people worshiping football looks more like what the children of God should be doing when it comes to Sunday morning and our worship. And so we love the presence of God. We get excited about the presence of God. I don't know about you, but Christ set me free from a lot of stuff, and he's worthy of worship. He's worthy of praise. And I made a decision a long time ago, nobody's going to get more of my attention, more of my shouts, more of my energy than God based on all that he had done for me. And so we think that's something to get excited about. And for the first, in, in our church, the first Wednesday of every month, we come together and we dedicate it with a time of prayer and worship. It's something we call Pursuit Night. And so this Wednesday at 7 o'clock from 7 to about 8.30, we have a time of just prayer and worship. We'll pray, pray in the spirit. We'll pray for specific things, needs of the body, um, different things going on in the world. And we just want to invite you to join us. You know, we believe that prayer is the catalyst for everything that we do here in Authentic Church. That is by the grace of God that after two years that God has done so many miracles and things in our midst. And so we think it's, it's good to continue in prayer what we were built on, you'll be maintained by. Whatever you build an organization on, where you, you build a, a company on, etc., whatever you build it on, you're going to have to maintain it by. And for us, this church has been built on prayer. Jesus said, my house will be known as a house of prayer. And so we honor him every, the first Wednesday of every month we come together. So I just want to invite you to come out in this particular Sunday or Wednesday night, excuse me, for those of you that are going to be leading some of the different community groups that we're going to have, the connect groups that are going to be launching here in the next month, uh, we want to have a special time to pray over you. So this Wednesday, no matter what you're doing, uh, we want you to hit pause on that and come and join us from 7 to 8.30. It'll be awesome. All right. Well, our vision here at Authentic Church is that we have times where we encounter God, we discover community, and we fulfill God's call on our life. That's our vision. Encounter God, discover community, and fulfill God's call in our life. And last week we jumped into, we looked at callings. And we've been going through a series this entire summer called Jesus People. And we've been looking at the, the, those moments where people had an encounter with Jesus. And, uh, and calling is more about who you are before what you do. Sometimes we start a, a new season of life, our kids are going back to school, maybe you're a student here or a faculty member, and it's a new season for you, and you're thinking and you're wondering, you're questioning, you're praying, what am I called to do? There's so many career choices, you know? And then you get to the end of your degree, and then you're like, man, <laughs> I really don't want to do what I got a degree in. <laughs> There's plenty of people that would say that, like, wow, I went to all this school, and I don't want to do any of this anymore. Like, I hate accounting. Why did I study to be an accountant, right? And so they're like, they're shifting. And so there's this question mark in our minds like, what is my calling? And I just want to encourage you, if you missed last week, go back and listen to the message. It was all about what God's calling you to, which is himself, before he calls you to do anything out there. Second Timothy says this, chapter 1, verse 9, it says, for God saved us 
and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from the beginning of time to show his grace through Christ Jesus. And that word holy is hagios, and that is to be set apart, set apart by or set apart for godly purpose. So even though this is a building on campus, this is actually a temple of worship. So this building has been is deemed holy because it's set apart for the things of God. It's not like just any other building here on campus. It's not just like any other building here in Costa Mesa. This building has been set apart, prayed over, anointed for the purpose of God. You have been called by God to be set apart. That our lives as believers in Christ should look different. Students, your lives should look different than somebody that doesn't know Christ that's on this campus or UCI or whatever other college that's in the area. Our lives should look different than our coworkers. For us believers, our marriages should look different than most people's marriages. Why? Because of Christ in us, the hope of glory. And I would just want to encourage you today, if you're wondering your calling and and, and sometimes you go through life and you're kind of like, man, you're trying to find your tribe. Anybody ever go through a season like that where you're trying to like find your tribe and your people, you know? And, and, and this morning, you might have walked in and you're like, man, I feel like this is my tribe, you know? I just want to encourage you that God has not called you to blend in. He's called you to stand out. So don't try to blend in when God is saying, no, 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 I've set you apart. I'm calling you to stand out. You're a difference maker. You're a change agent. You're, you're like, praise God for what we have on our walls in this place, which is called a thermostat, not a thermometer, right? The thermostat sets the temperature to 70 degrees in this room while it's 95,000 degrees outside, right? By the way, how many of you have air conditioning in your rooms? Okay, put your hands down. How many of you don't have air conditioning? Okay, so you air conditioning people, you can be Christians today, and you can invite all the unair conditioned people over to your house and you can house them today and everything else, right? Colossians 3.17 says this, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Uh, last year, as we kind of took a step back at Authentic Church, you know, we were just a year into it and we, we pulled back before the holidays and we just kind of re-looked at the canvas that is authentic, and we pulled some leaders in, and we asked a few questions, and one of the questions that we asked, we, we sat around my, my table in, in, in Fawn and I's house, and we took out some post-it notes, and we wrote down, and we answered this question. It was two questions. One, the first question was, I'm at my worst when I fill in the blank. So we, we answered that for ourselves. I'm at my worst. Jeff Peterson is at his worst when he... Man, he's not rested, he's frustrated, he's not prayed, he hasn't read his Bible. I wrote down all these different things, right? And then we posted them on, on one side of the, the dining room. And they're like, okay, cool, everybody breathe, you're saved by the grace, <laughs> right? You know, so you're okay. All right, now let's write down, I'm at my best when I, what's that? And then we took out the post-it notes, I'm at my best when I'm prayed up, I'm at my best when I'm rested, oh, I'm, at my, I'm at my best after I spend time in the presence of God. Uh, I, I'm, I'm at my best when I wake up early, when I get to bed early, when I get a good night's sleep, I'm at my best, right? So we wrote down those things, and then we truncated those into different segments that kind of began to form some, some similarities, and then they became, became columns, and then from that, we ended up uh, putting together what became known as our culture card. If you're new to Authentic Church, we have a culture card on our connect table. It tells you a little bit more of the DNA of who we are as a church. And from that, we, we kind of truncated and put together, we have some authentic attributes, and then we had some leadership standards, like, hey, this is, this is what the, the, the bar that we're setting for anybody that wants to be a leader within Authentic Church. And then we had our core values. And your core values for you as a person, or a church, or an organization, or a company, core values essentially, in short, it's like, if I cut you, this is what you bleed. This is who you really are. So it's not like aspirational, like I want to be this. No, no, no. Who are you really? Like who are you really? And from that, we have these core values that came. And, and one of the values uh, with our church would be that we would be people of rest, that we'd be healthy. So health is a value for us, that we would be emotionally healthy. And it's, this, it's one of those things where when you have a value, and all of us have values in this room, your values are different than my values. 
My values as a man with five kids and two grandbabies is different than when I was 20 years old and a single dad. I was a single dad when I was 20. My values are, look a little bit different as a man that's saved and walking with God than my values were when I was not saved and not walking with God, right? And your values will kind of change, but over the course of time, there are some core values that you have. And today, what I'm going to do is I want to help us kind of recalibrate and take a look at seven areas of our lives where we really go, you know what, that, that's, a, that's, that's a good thing that I need to adopt. Um, I don't know, is there any gun owners in this room? You can raise your hand, it's totally cool. Great, so you, when we get our new building, then you guys are going to be on the security team. So I just want to know who, who my people are, <laughs> right? <laughs> my bit. And so, so those of you that, have gun, that are gun owners, if you've ever shot a gun, have you ever shot a gun with a scope? Like, that's a difference maker, man. When you shoot a rifle and you got a scope on it and you can see, like, way down, you, you know, you see a few hundred yards. Like, the scope is a difference maker. Well, if you own a gun and you have a scope, one of the things that you have to do often is what? You have to recalibrate it, right? And so the recalibration helps you to hit the target that you're aiming at. Today's message, hopefully, will be a bit of a recalibration to help us all, as a family of God, as a church, hit the target that we want to aim at. You don't want to get to December and go, man, I wish I would have spent more time the last three months doing X, Y, Z. And by the way, for any of you Christmas fanatics out there, there is 15 more Saturdays until Christmas. You're welcome. So I, I pray that today's message does that for all of us, that we recalibrate a little bit. So I'm going to pray. And then we're going to jump into it. We're going to be like, you know, like James, uh, James chapter 1. It talks about the man who looks at his face in the mirror and, and he walks away and he doesn't remember what he looked like. Today we're going to look at ourselves in the mirror and I'm praying that we walk away and we know what we look like and we remember this moment. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you, Lord, that nobody came here to hear a man speak. We all came to hear you speak. So I pray that you would speak and continue to do what you've been doing all morning, Holy Spirit. Lead, guide, direct, challenge, encourage. Thank you, Lord. Convict. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And we just welcome you now. God, I pray that you give us eyes to see something in your word today that we never saw before. You give us ears to hear something we never heard before, Lord. I pray for fresh revelation. I pray that our minds would just grow with knowledge in you and understanding and revelation that brings transformation and that you give us all hearts today to believe you at your word. And so, Lord, we just ask, speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I've been walking with God for about 24 years now, and uh, one thing that I started doing early on is I kept a file. Back in the day, it was tapes, believe it or not, and then it was CDs. And then it's just messages that you save on your podcast. But I had uh, a, a different way that I labeled some of those messages, and I called them life messages. And a life message for me was one of those things that I could go back and listen to as I changed seasons in life. It's one of those messages I could go back to to help me recalibrate every six months, 12 months-ish. And, um, and so my prayer today is that this message would be one of those for you. Uh, that it would be the type of message where you're like, oh, that's a tool in my spiritual tool belt. That's something that I can put in practice today and see a return on investment. That's something that, that I feel like, man, that, that challenges me, that encourages me, that, that is good fruit. And so today's message for some of you, it may feel a little bit elementary. For others, it's going to be like uh, fresh revelation. You're going to be like, man, I never saw things that way. Those are good. But overall, these are seven key areas, best practices, if you will, to protect your calling. So I titled this message, Seven Keys to Protecting Your Calling. And all of you have been called by, by God. You've been called and filled with his spirit to do something. He has a desire for you to do something incredible. But incredible to you may look different than what incredible to the world looks like. The incredible calling God may have for you is to be that incredible mom who wakes up and prays for her babies before she sends them out the door. One of the things that we do in our house, and we were going around the table last night with the kiddos, and we were asking, we were like, hey, what's one thing in this season as we start the school year, what's one thing you feel like God's telling you to stop doing, and what's one thing that you feel like God's telling you to start doing? And so we just went around the table, and, and everybody kind of listed off their things, and one of the things that, that we're doing more of as a family 
is reading scriptures over our kids every night before they go to bed, that the last thing that they hear from their father is the word of God and a hug and a kiss, I love you, I'm proud of you. And that is so critical. You may not get that from your earthly father due to the season of life you're in, but your heavenly father wants to do that for you. And one thing I know about God is when we honor him with our time, he is so faithful to honor us with his presence. James 4.8 says it this way. It says, when you draw near to God, that he's faithful. He's going to draw near to you. And so I just want to encourage you as you start this week, as you lean into Labor Day, uh, and even throughout this message, is just leaning into God, like drawing near to him, listening for him. As I speak, my prayer is that somewhere along the lines of the message that the Holy Spirit just takes over and you don't hear any more words coming out of my mouth and it's just God giving you a download. That's one of the most beautiful things that can happen in a setting like this. So that's our prayer. Uh, I mentioned earlier how college football started. I'm more of an NFL fan. How many are more NFL than college? More NFL than college? So uh, uh, one of the greatest coaches that ever coached in the NFL is a guy named Vince Lombardi. Uh, he actually only coached for nine years, but everybody talks about him like he was like a mythical Greek god that coached for like centuries. Uh, but he actually only coached for nine years, the Green Bay Packers. And, um, but he was the winningest coach, and he achieved more in nine years than any other coach in history has ever done. And one of the things that he would do, he'd get these big gruff guys and they're ready to play football, man. And this was back when you could like really hit in football. Now when you go and rush the quarterback, you almost got to like give him a warm hug that says I love you and pick him up and then cradle them and lay them on the ground like you're laying a baby to sleep, right? Back in those days with Vince Lombardi, like you'd hit somebody and blow their head off, you know, like you know, the linebacker would come through. And Vince Lombardi, he would get all these guys and he'd bring them in close when they started the, uh, the, the preseason workouts and he'd have, he'd say, gentlemen, take a knee. And he would stand there and he, he wore his suit and his tie and he had this classic look to him and he would hold up a football and he'd say, gentlemen, this is a football. And he was so, and it's like, we know it's a football, but he was so big on the basics of the game that before we do all these other cool things and these cool plays and Z routes and everything else, let's just focus on the basic aspects. Sometimes, especially in different settings like a, a college scene or uh, if you go deep into theology, sometimes you can kind of get lost in the forest and the woods and everything. And you need to just pull back and go like, hey, what are, what, what are we doing this all for? Like, what is this all about? And what is my life? What, what is my practice? What, what is my rhythm of life? What is it really all about? Today's message, hopefully, will bring it back. To, this is a football. So here's seven keys. The first key that I have for us today is number one, and this is preaching to the choir, commit to being in church every single week. Seven keys to protecting your calling, because Satan's after your calling. <laughs> he wants to get you away from the family of God. He wants you to isolate. He wants you to go weeks on end without praying, reading your Bible, getting into a house of worship. That's what Satan wants to do to you. God calls us to draw close. And Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So Hebrews 10.25 was written at a time when a gentleman named Nero was in power, and Nero was going around and he was looking for Christians and killing them because it pleased the crowd. So there was massive upheaval uh, in, the, in the area at that time, and Nero thought to please the people, to gain favor with them, I'm going to go grab the Christians and kill them. And there's many other reasons and political stuff that was going on. But Christians were an easy target. Why? Because they would gather together from house to house. They would pray. They would worship and everything. And so they would go and get them. they literally walk in and grab men, women, and children and babies, drag them out, put them into jail, beat them, torture them, then throw them out in the middle of the Colosseum for sport as it's filled with all the people that have come to watch. And then lions would be released literally to rip them limb from limb for being a Christian. So that's what's happening in the world. A little bit worse than the last two years of COVID and all that stuff's going on. But the writer of Hebrews says, despite that, despite what's going on, I want to make sure, do not neglect meeting together. 
Don't neglect gathering together, that there's something so special when we come together in the house of God. And some of you, sometimes you'll walk in here, you're like, man, I didn't really need that today, but it was cool, but you didn't know that God placed you in the seat you're in next to the person that you're next to to be an encouragement to them. I can't tell you how many times when I was a new Christian, as a single dad walking into a church, my life was a mess, not knowing what I was going to do with my life, feeling totally disconnected, feeling a little bit of a social stiff arm from all the perfect people that I, as I viewed them at church. And I walked in, and I can't tell you how warm it was just to have a few people say good morning and give me a hug. There's times where you don't know how far your greeting goes. When people that greet at the front, and you know, as people are walking in or pouring a, a hot cup of coffee, although I think we could have all used an iced coffee today, if they're pouring a cup of, you have no idea what that does to somebody. You know, you have no idea what that did to me as a young man. And, and so for us as a church family, there's going to be some Sundays, man, where it's just like the Holy Spirit's just wham, just hitting you, right? And then there's other times that you come and it was more about you being here for the person next to you than necessarily for you. But that's part of being part of the family of God. So don't neglect meeting. Commit to being at church every single week. Number two, key to protecting your calling. Number two is choose your friends wisely. Choose your running mates wisely. Proverbs 12, 26 says this, the righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Some people have said your life is gonna be the sum of your five closest friends and, 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 and I, I believe that after you know, walking and seeing people come and go in life, I, I believe that, that you really are going to be like who you associate with, especially with your children. That's why parents, you need to be on guard with you, who your kids are spending time with, right? Bad company corrupts good character. That's out of Proverbs, okay? So you got to be careful of who you're surrounding yourself with. And three relationships, key relationships, is kind of a sub point that everybody needs. Everyone needs these three relationships. Everybody needs a Paul. Everybody needs a Barnabas. And my prayer is, especially as a pastor in this house, is that everybody has a Timothy. The Paul is the teacher. They're the sage. They're the, the prophet. They're the pastor. They're the leader. They're somebody that you typically is usually a few years older than you, but somebody that can speak into your life, that can kind of put their finger into different areas. You're like, I wouldn't take that from anybody else, but because it's coming from you, I'll listen. We all need that pastor. I have pastors, I have leaders in my life, and they call me on the carpet, trust me. <laughs> Some of them listen to every single message I preach, and then we regurgitate things <laughs> throughout the week, okay? So we need people in our lives. We, need, we all need a Paul, somebody that's gone before us. If you're starting a new job or a business or what have you, you need a Paul. You need somebody that's gonna teach you, that's gonna lead, her, lead you, somebody that's gonna mentor you. And then the second person we all need is a Barnabas. Barnabas is kinda like a running mate. You need a friend. You need somebody, that you, for you ladies, you, you'd say you could let your hair down and not put makeup on and sit in your yoga pants or your sweats or whatever and not do anything but just sit on the couch, right? You need those types of friends where it's like you don't got to put on a front or anything and they're going to encourage you in the things of God. They're going to challenge you. They're going to love you. They're going to hang out with you. They're, they're going to be running mates, right? You need that Barnabas. Barnabas was known as the son of encouragement and God gave Bar Paul a gift when he brought Barnabas into his life. And then the third one there, the Timothy, that's where you go, you know what, my life, it's bigger than just me. It's bigger than my group of friends. I actually want to find somebody that I can pour into. And that's where you find a Timothy. Timothys are typically somebody a little bit younger than you, maybe a season or two of life behind you that you're pouring into. My wife and I were doing uh, some premarital counseling for some friends of ours that are getting married here in a couple of weeks. And so we, we've been meeting with them every week. And it's, it's so fun as we talk to them I'm finding as we're giving advice, I'm, I'm like, this is good advice. I need to take this advice. Do you ever do that? <laughs> right? It's kind of like sometimes a good question would be when you look at your own life is how would you counsel somebody in your situation? <laughs> and so we're counseling them and we're getting to know them and going through and asking a lot of the tough questions, the deep questions, and it's just so beautiful to see things come out. And it's good for them and it's a joy for us. We all need a Timothy in our lives that we can, that we can pour into. And the third part, third key of, of protecting your calling is keeping a set schedule. 
Some of us, that sounds like just a, uh, an evil word, to keep a set schedule, oh my God, I don't want a set schedule, I wanna, I'm a free bird, especially when you're a student and you're finally out of your house and you're like, my God, I can sleep into as long as I want to sleep in, I can eat whatever I want, this is heaven, like this is the best, right, getting out of the house for the first time, but I want to encourage you to keep a set schedule, as my wife mentioned when she was up here just sharing with some of the highlights that are going on for Authentic Church, like she's excited about fall, you know, especially today. Like I think we're all kind of like, summer was cool, great, let's bring on fall, sweater weather. We all want sweater weather. We want the leaves to turn. You want that candle that smells like fall, the pumpkin spice and everything else, right? You want, yeah, anybody ready for that? I love that season, you know? And so keep a set schedule. Ephesians 5, 5 15 through 17 says this, says look carefully how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I just want to brag on my daughter, uh, Brighton, for a minute on a set schedule. Uh, this summer, she actually decided, she said, you know what, I'm, I, summer's been great, I've had my fun. But in August, she decided, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and set myself to a tough schedule. So she was waking up. In the morning at 7.30, she was spending time with God, reading her Bible. Then she had a workout routine that she was doing. And then she was learning Spanish because she wanted to grow in speaking Spanish, you know. And, uh, and then she would study some top topic, and she kept this cool journal of all these unique things. So, like, she would just, like, study, like, you know, whatever it would be. Like, you know, I want to discuss study, like, when did people start making scrambled eggs and stuff like that. So she would study something like that. Or, you know, she, she would study, you know, this country or study why did people ever wear corsets like how did that become a thing you know so she would just find these different kind of unique kind of what if why this that and the other and she would study those and she would begin to keep a set schedule and a rhythm and now as she looks back before she starts school she has this whole notebook full of all these fun things that she got to grow and discover and things like like and that all came from having a set schedule I like how Stephen Covey says he says the key is not to prioritize your schedule but to schedule your priorities. The key is not to prioritize your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. Uh, if you were to look at my uh, calendar on my phone, I literally schedule out on some days down to every 15 minutes. And I know for some people, like you're like, that would drive me crazy. For me, it really helps keep me on task, where I don't necessarily schedule like, hey, I'm gonna do whatever it would be, administrative stuff. I'm, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to do this administrative thing. I'm checking email for the next 15 minutes, right? And then that's done, and then I'm doing a break. But you have to figure out what works for you. But the point is this, is actually figuring out what really is my priority. And then you schedule things around it. So like for us, prayer in my house is a priority. So when I start my day, I don't know about you, but if I don't start my day with prayer and time in the Word, it's amazing how the day gets away from me. And then I'm like, man, I haven't really even prayed or read my Bible much. Right? I mean, everybody, anybody have a day like that? Have a week like that? Have a month like that? Have a year like that? Right? And if you don't take time to really think, what am I prioritizing? Um, you know, like every Tuesday night in my house is date night. So Fawn and I, every Tuesday night, we go out on a date. Sometimes our dates are more elaborate than others. Sometimes if budget is tight and it's dinner on the cheap, it's a picnic dinner and we sit at castaways and we overlook Newport as the sun sets. You know, but that is a priority to us. So we, we have that. We've prioritized that in the, our schedule. So a thought is, what is your priority? What are you prioritizing in your life? And I would add this in here, too, um, as a kind of a, a, an extra, if you will, an extra point on this set schedule. Eat healthy. Exercise. Get good sleep. If you're a freshman, you don't want the freshman 15. Everybody's heard of the freshman 15. If you don't have the freshman 15, it turns into the sophomore 30, okay? So just being honest. So, so eat healthy. Feed your body good food. Don't eat a bunch of junk food and things like that. That's, that's going to zap you of energy. No, fill, your, fill yourself with some good food. Get good sleep. Take time to exercise, even if you're just going on a walk. There's so many health benefits to just going on a walk. For me, I, when, I, when I pray, a lot of times, I, I, I grew up when we would pray, growing up Catholic, I would go and I'd go into the confessional, right? And you'd get in your, your position and you, you're trying to like, you know, be quiet and everything else as a you know, young elementary student. And, and, and you'd try to pray. And to me, that was praying. And then when I got saved, I'm like, man, 
I got too much energy. If I sit down, like I'm, my mind's going to be going like this, so I need to get up and walk. So for me personally, I like walking and praying. So like when we get together and pray as a church, I'm like pacing. I can't just like sit in that row and be happy in the pew. Like I'd be ready to rip the pew off, you know, like I need, I need motion, right? And some of you are wired that way. Even if you are a student here and you're just going on a prayer walk over the campus, such a gorgeous campus anyway, but just taking time to just pray and walk and just talk to God like you're walking with a friend. Don't try to view it as you're like, hello, Lord, 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 Lord. Are you there? There, there. No, just talk to him like a friend, you know, like, man, I got good sleep last night. How did you, did you get good sleep? <laughs> Just talk to God like he's a close friend of yours. 1 Corinthians 6.12 says this, You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Man, you don't want to become a slave to anything. I've become a slave to some things throughout my years in life, right? You don't want to be a slave to anything. So whatever that might be that God's putting his finger on right now, what's, what's, what's that habit? What's, what's that schedule piece? What is that? Number four to protecting your, your calling. The fourth area is start a Bible reading plan. Get in the Bible every single day. It's one of the best habits that you can have. When you take time to get into the word of God like we talked about in James earlier, the word of God is like a mirror. And as you read the Word of God, the Word of God starts to read you, and you start to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That is a good thing. That is a God thing. Psalms 119 says this, Your Word, it's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, shows me how to walk, shows me where to go. Question for you this morning, what did God speak to you in your Bible reading today? How about yesterday? What did God speak to you in your Bible reading yesterday? Last week? In the last month, what has God been speaking to you about? And I just want to encourage you to spend time in the Word of God. Like, make that a daily habit. That he's our daily bread. And there's plenty of Bible reading plans on the YouVersion Bible app if you like that. I like the, the feel of turning the pages in my my Bible, I got, I'm, I'm the Bible nerd, I got the Bible highlighters and everything else, and I got certain colors, pink is like, wow, that was awesome, blue is like, that's wisdom, Holy Spirit, green is any scripture about finances or money or wealth or what have you, and red is about redemption, the blood of Christ, freedom, salvation, stuff like that, and then I take notes, like I'm a note taker, just all over my Bible. And I've taught my kids to do this. And so when they read the Bible, I have actually some of my Bibles that I have through the years. Um, I got notes and scribble marks from all my kids like using dad's Bible. And they're just like highlighting this or circling that, you know. And it's just such a good reminder that, you know, that, that, that time that you spend um, highlighting, the Lord's going to use that and speak to you. When you're focused on reading with a highlighter, just mentally you're looking for something to highlight. Right? If you're holding a highlighter in your hand and you're reading, you're thinking, what's going to stand out to me? And I find a lot of times that when you come with that level of expectation in reading the Word of God, you're going to get something. So read the Bible, commit to having time with God, get, write notes, journal, whatever helps you engage Him. The goal isn't to check a box on your Bible reading plan, your goal is to encounter God, okay? So don't get so focused on reading three chapters in the old and one chapter in the new, that you lose the connection of just having that encounter with God. The goal is that when you're reading the Bible, that suddenly as you read it, something makes you pause. And it's almost like the Holy Spirit puts an X on the page and says, there's treasure there I want you to dig. That's what you're looking for you when you read the Word of God. Number five, the fifth area in terms of protecting your calling is live generously. Live generously. You know, life, I, I hate to break it to you, but life's not about you. It's not all about you. We, we want things to be about us, right, especially on our birthday. <laughs> we, we want things to be about us, but the reality is the greatest fulfillment that you're ever going to have in life is when you're doing something for somebody else. Life's not about you. Matthew 23, 11 says, the greatest among you must be the greatest servant. Find areas to serve other people. Whether it's serving at church or serving in a homeless shelter or even just a simple act of opening the door for people when you're walking into a building. The law of reciprocity catches up when you begin to serve others. Man, it does more for you than it does for them, right? Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. 
And in giving, you end up receiving as well. It's a beautiful thing. One of our core values here at Authentic Church is generosity. And generosity isn't just when it comes to our finances. Some people lose the beauty of what generous what generosity really means. Generosity, we have, this is one of our core values that I talked about. It's, we, we, we say we live open-handed. The axiom is live open-handed. We believe that everything belongs to God, so we cheerfully give and steward our time, talents, and our resources. Time, talents, and our resources. Let's live generously. Make a decision, no matter if you got 20 cents in your pocket, 20 bucks in your pocket, or $20,000 in your bank account. Make a decision now as a habit, as a life habit. Man, you know what? I'm going to live generously. If I can help somebody, I'm going to help them. If I can bless somebody, I'm going to bless them. With our time, it, where can we serve? Where can we help out? And what can we get involved in? I'm so grateful for different people like my buddy Peter that's sitting back here. And Peter said, hey, I'm going to help out. I'm going to serve our kids' ministry. And, man, I'm going to teach and pour into them. And I, even though a lot of kids don't have cons, a consistent male role model in their lives, I'm going to sign up and be a consistent male role model model for them every two weeks every other week I'm serving in the kids ministry and I'm going to go and I would be honored to teach our kids like I love that heart and that attitude and in the, a lot of times just in that giving we end up getting a lot more than what we gave so serve others with our time our talents our resources number six six area to protect your calling pray daily don't let a day go by where you don't have time just talking to God just walking with him, talking with him, hanging out. Colossians 4.2 excuse me, says this. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Be watchful in it with thanksgiving. Pray. Pray about everything. What's going on in your life? What's going on in the world? If you have nothing to pray about, I think you need to ask bigger questions. <laughs> If there's nothing to pray about in your world, then begin to pray about what's going on in someone else's world. A lot of times on my Fridays, um, my Friday, uh, the way that I have my week structured is really, um, I, I just have time with God and a lot of time it's spent on my knees or on the floor in my office. <laughs> and I'm praying and, and a lot of times I'm praying for all of you. By name, we have a a database or an app that we use for the church. And, and I just go through there and I just pray over the names and pray over you and your job or your classes or your friends or your family or what's going on in your life and just pray a blessing over you. And I ask the Holy Spirit, is there anything in particular I need to hone in on? And so a lot of times if you're sitting here and you've gotten a text message from me, it's probably come when I've been going through and I've been praying and I've prayed over you and I felt like the Holy Spirit says, hey, text them and just ask them what you can be in agreement with them on. Text them the scripture. Text them to encourage them. If you don't have anything that you think about to pray for you, text somebody else and say, hey, bro, I'm thinking about you today. How can I pray for you, Aaron? You know, what, what's going on in your world? Let me know what's going on in your world. How can I be praying for you today? And be a prayerful person. So pray daily. And the seventh area, the seventh area in protecting your calling is you got to protect your purity. Protect your purity. Purity is under such an attack, such an attack. And not just for men, and it's for women as well. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5 says this, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles, the unbelievers, who don't know God. That we protect the purity of our lives, and we protect our hearts, our minds. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says this. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. But the sexual immoral person sins against their own body. Some people say, well, sin is sin. Every sin is just sin. Every sin is redeemed the same as all sin is redeemed. And it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, you're correct. All sin is sin in that sense. But not all sin has the same ramifications. Sexual sin carries a different weight. Murder carries a different weight, right? There's certain sins that carry a different weight than lying on your taxes, right? We would all agree that. And sexual sin is nothing to play with. And the Lord is really, really strict on that. And I just want to encourage you, no matter where you are in your journey with God, is to reclaim your purity, this, is, this can be a holy time. If you walked in here today and purity is something where you feel like you've stumbled, like you take a few good steps and then you trip again, and you take a few good and you trip again, I just want to encourage you today, at the end of service, we're going to have a time of communion. I encourage you to do business with God. 
and just pray and just seek forgiveness, wholeness, a cleansing. And I would even go further and to say, if you really struggle in an area of purity, you need an accountability partner. I have several men in my life that we ask back and forth. We have eight qu accountability questions that we go back and forth with weekly in keeping ourselves accountable from our purity in our thoughts, our eyes, our actions, to our spending, uh, to being uh, those that are pursuing our calling, whatever God's called us to. And, and I just encourage you, if you've had times where that's been a hang-up in your past, maybe you feel like, no, I'm, I'm kind of good now. I've kind of gotten over that. I, I don't feel like I'm struggling as much as, as I am right now. That's awesome. But there's going to be a time where Satan is going to revisit that old sin that was in your life. And in that moment, you need to have an accountability person. You need that Barnabas. You need that Paul. You need somebody that can speak into your life. So I want to encourage you to get accountability in your life. And purity isn't just about sexual purity. It's purity in your heart. Protect your purity of your heart, your, your, your thoughts, your ideas. How do, you, how, how do you deal with the hurt that you've experienced, the people who've let you down? Maybe it was a parent, a friend, a loved one, and somebody wounded you. Maybe it was a pastor or a leader in a church, and you feel, ouch, man, I feel wounded by that. you got to guard the purity of your heart. Don't let that thing hang you up. A lot of times, the pain that you've experienced the healing will come through somebody else. If somebody experienced church hurt or pastoral pain, a lot of times they're going to receive healing from a pastor that's going to bring the love of Jesus the way that God intended to have that pastor shepherd and love you and care for you. A lot of times when you've experienced relational pain, maybe you're formally married and you've been through a divorce, a lot of time the way that you experience a deeper realm of healing is going to be through that other person or maybe a, a male person or a female in your life that just loves you for who you are. What is it? What does that area of purity protect you on? 2 Timothy 22 says this, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So just to recap, the seven keys to protecting your purity, and I'm going to have Isaac join me up front on the guitar. So the seven keys to protecting your calling. Number one, commit to being in church every week. For my wife and I, this is like a, a, a non-negotiable. For us, we, we can't think of a better way to honor God for all that he's blessed our family with. When I look at the blessings of God in my life all week long, I'm like, man, the least I can do is come before him for an hour and a half or two hours on a Sunday and worship and thank the creator who's given us so much. Amen, right? And so we gladly come. And so for our family, anytime we were in town, I get it, people travel, everybody has different schedules. Every once in a while, somebody gets sick. I, I get that. But when we're in town, this was a priority. It wasn't like, we're going to wake up and if I feel good, I'm going to go to church. No, no, no. We, we made a decision for our family. You know what? We're going to be in church every single Sunday. It's going to be an encouragement to us. It's going to be an example to our kids. And it's going to be, hopefully, I could be an encouragement to somebody else. Number two, choose friends wisely. Who are you running with? Who are you vulnerable with? Who... Who are you really known by? Have you opened yourself up to really be known? In a few weeks, we're going to be launching our, our connect group, small group time, and, and uh, it's going to be awesome. And there's going to be great times, and, and there's a lot that can happen in the course of our Sunday uh, services here that are great, but more happens in the a living room around a table at a coffee shop than that happens in pews. You know what I mean? There's a lot that happens with that connection. So choose your friends wisely. Three, get a set schedule. <laughs> I encourage you, set your schedule. If you don't set your schedule, someone else will. Somebody else will define your priorities if you don't. So set that schedule. Number four, get that Bible reading plan. Maybe maybe you, you were like me. I started a Bible reading plan a few years ago. I was like, I'm gonna read through the whole Bible in a year. Two and a half years later, Pastor Jeff finally finished his Bible reading plan, okay? Pick it back up. Get in the Word of God again. Make it a priority. First thing in the morning, before I pick up this device, I'm not going to be a slave to this device. Before I go digital, I'm going to spend time in the Word of God. I'm going to spend time on my knees. I'm going to spend time with the King of Kings. Number five, just decide I'm going to live generous, live open-handedly. 
So many talents and giftings are represented in this room. Do something with it. Do it to be a betterment to the friends and family around you, to society. Number six, commit to praying daily. And if you don't know how to pray, I just want to encourage you again, come meet with us on Wednesday night. I didn't know how to pray when I was a new Christian, and then I got around some praying people, and I'm like, man, that was good for my soul, right? When I wanted to learn how to be a good husband, I got around good husbands that were awesome at loving their wives. When I wanted to learn how to pray, I got around people who knew how to pray. On Wednesday night at 7 p.m. right here in this room, you're going to be surrounded by people who know how to pray. And we're going to pray with you and pray over you. And we're going to lean into some things. Number seven, protect your purity. Be vigilant in that. From a jail in Rome, one day Paul wrote a letter to a young man named Timothy. And Timothy was doing his best to pastor this church in Ephesus. And, and Paul had sent him encouraging words before, but these words really stood out. And at the end of Paul's life, he was coming to the tail end, like this is the last lap that I'm making. This might be the last letter that I'm sending. My, my, the window on my life is coming to a close. And so Paul sends him a, a letter, and in the letter he says this. He said, Timothy, the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Notice the order that Paul put that in. Faithful and able. That there's a premium the world places on somebody's ability. How you do in class, how you do at your job gifted in that. You're so creative. You're so smart. Blah, blah, blah. Everything else, right? But God says, but how faithful are you? If I'm honest with you, you know, there, there was something in my life where I was like, you know what? I, I wanted to do something important. I wanted people to look at Jeff Peterson and go like, man, look at his marriage. Look at his family. Like there was something in my life where I, I, I wanted that kind of from a respect or an admiration, if I'm just being honest with you. And, 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 and so that fueled my fire for a season. But you know, sometime I'm going to come to the end of my days, like Paul got to the end of his days. And I'm not going to hear, man, Jeff, well done, good and important person. Well done, good and successful businessman. Well done, good, no. At the end of my days, hopefully, the words that I hear are well done, good, and faithful servant. And in this season, I just want to encourage us all as we go back to a rhythm of life, go back to school, and head into the fall, I just want to encourage us, those seven key areas, just put that in practice. Maybe you need to write them out. Maybe you need to post that up on your mirror. Maybe you need to keep that somewhere tucked in your Bible. Like, where, how am I doing? How, if I graded myself one through five, how am I doing? Am I good, bad, eh? Can I improve this? Just what are some areas? And it all stems from being close, first and foremost, to Jesus. But let's decide to be people who are faithful to God. Let's be faithful what he's put in our hands. Amen? Well, I'm going to pray for you today. And we're going to have a time of communion. We're going to have a time of prayer. At Authentic Church, one of our practices is at the end of service, we always have a time of prayer where we make ourselves available to pray with you for whatever's going on in your life. Uh, maybe you just need prayer for a situation on the job or marriage or health uh, or a test you're taking or just feeling overwhelmed. I had somebody that I talked to this week and they were just feeling a little bit of pressure and anxiety and some stress with their first week of school and all the, the crazy assignments that they were given just the first week. I don't know what you walked in here carrying today, but I promise you this, if it feels burdensome to you, God doesn't want you to walk out carrying that same thing. He wants you to lay it at the cross today. So we're going to have a time of prayer. We're going to have a time of communion as Isaac leads us in this last song. And 
at your own pace, you can just go ahead and come to the front. There's communion on both sides. I'm going to have the prayer team join me up front at this time. On both sides, there's going to be people available just to pray with you as you come forward uh, to receive communion. And you can just go ahead and do that now. Let's go ahead and stand, all of us. And let's just have a time before the Lord. God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord God, for speaking to us. Thank you, Lord God, for your hand in this message. Thank you for putting your finger on things in our lives that we would be transformed and changed. Lord, that we would be people that seek you first. And God, I pray that if anybody needs to be made right with you today, God, that they would call on the name of the Lord and be saved. That they would believe on the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior and their life would be transformed. If you're here today and you're like, man, all this stuff sounds great, but my relationship with God is next to none. I don't even know what that looks like. I'm going to tell you, it starts with just from your heart believing in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'm going to lead you in praying a prayer. Um, the prayer is powerful because it is a first step in your relationship with God. It's, it's you inviting him in. It's, it's like when a, a man, as he's courting a woman, he asks her out and asks to take her on that first day. This is just the beginning. It's the start of the relationship. And I just want to lead you in prayer this morning, today. But if that's you, we're all, as a church body, we're going to pray with you. So I'm going to lead you in the prayer. And the whole church, Authentic Church, is just going to join with me. I'm going to give you some words. And if you really want to call on the name of the Lord today, if you're saying, man, I need to get right with God. I need to, I need to recalibrate. I was walking with God once. I'm coming back to Him. Wherever, whatever your story is in this room, if you pray this prayer from your heart that you really mean it, everything is about to change for your eternity. Everything is about to change for your eternity. So we'll just pray this prayer just after me. Say, Lord Jesus, come on, all the church. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life today, fresh and new. I pray for a refreshing in my soul. I pray that you would forgive me of all my sins. Set me free from anything that's held me back. Cleanse me. Make me whole. I put my faith and my trust in you. I believe in you, Jesus, that you died and you rose again. I put my faith in you today. And I believe your word that says, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I thank you, Lord, right now for receiving me as your child. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer, this is just the beginning. God's got awesome things in store for you. We're going to have time of communion now. You can just go ahead and make your way to the front. There's communion on both sides. Just encourage you to come up. If you need prayer for anything, please step to the side to one of the prayer team here. We'd be honored to pray with you this morning. For more information on Authentic Church, visit us online at AuthenticOC.com.